Senator Xenophon. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. just wanted to make a few uh, comments on uh, Sydney Airport, Western Sydney Airport, and uh, I commend Senator Xenophon for his great interest and passion around aviation and protecting uh, our aviation assets. He and I have worked quite closely on the Rural Affairs and Transport Committee on a number of occasions. Uh, I do differ a little with him in terms of our major airports. The intent of the government, uh, when I think it was then Deputy Prime Minister Anderson, looked at uh, privatising airports, I think with our major airports has actually been relatively well met. As I look and travel around the country, I see that the privatisation has allowed an injection of capital which has transformed uh, the major gateways into each of our states around Australia. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say I'm quite so supportive of our secondary airports, the likes of uh, Bankstown and Archerfield and others uh, around the country. And uh, as recently as last weekend, when I was up in Port Augusta uh, speaking with the manager of the unincorporated lands, I'm very aware of the fact that uh, airfields that are owned by local government, and particularly those who serve remote communities, are constantly under pressure in terms of maintaining uh, the airfields to be capable of taking, whether it's the Royal Flying Doctor or mail services or other services they critically need. And so um, there are a couple of aspects to privatisation. Those in secondaries and remote areas. Uh, I'm not as such a great fan of. I think we still need to find ways to invest in those and make them uh, viable for the future. But in terms of our primary airports, uh, it certainly has transformed Australia, and particularly when you look at the role of the airports as a hub, not only for passenger movements uh, but also for freight. Uh, and this week, in fact, I met with the uh, Sydney Airport to talk about the Western Sydney Airport and understand what their plans are in terms of servicing regional communities and having that connection with international flights, because uh, I certainly compare it with South Australia, where the advent of international flights, for example, going direct from Adelaide Airport into Asia and places like Hong Kong and therefore China, means that where we have an export industry and, our, for example, our prawn industry, which doesn't have the volumes to justify a freight aircraft all by itself, and there are other industries in a similar case, once you have a passenger service, it means that you have the ability to get freight onto that aircraft and into a market, and it opens up new markets around the world. But the important part is to have that link, and certainly a key part of my discussions uh, around Western Sydney Airport was to make clear in my mind that the planning of the airports and the airlines was to have a joined up service where we didn't leave regional communities in the situation where if they had business to conduct, travel to do or importantly uh, exports to get to market, we didn't end up in a situation where they were relegated to a secondary airport and then had to make a connection across Sydney to a major airport, and I'm pleased to report that that's not uh, the intention that's certainly uh, being proposed at the moment. The best thing, though, I think about it, Sydney, Western Sydney Airport, is you know, having been in the aviation industry for many years and uh, watched debates flow to and fro. I'm very conscious that people have talked and talked and talked about Sydney Airport and where it might be uh, for longer than I think Senator Ian Macdonald has been talking about Traveston Dam. Um, by the time we built Sydney Airport, perhaps we'd have float planes on Traveston Dam. But um, I'm glad to see that finally, after many years, we actually have uh, a decision on a location and now we've started the process towards creating this airport. If you look at the number of movements that come through Sydney, and particularly if you look at the management of traffic, and they have a cap on the number of movements in a period of time, and it comes right down to managing that number of aircraft even within a quarter of an hour block. Uh, it actually makes it very inefficient for the airlines in terms of bringing aircraft in, because if they've delayed, if they had divert around weather, for example, a volcanic activity in Indonesia or somewhere, and they fall outside uh, one of the, their, their pre-approved slot, and then there is more aircraft programmed in a period and they don't have the fuel to hold, uh, they end up getting diverted. And in terms of the reputation of Australia as an international de uh, destination, the last thing you want is uncertainty on behalf of the passengers as to whether they're going to end up in Sydney, which is where they wanted to go, or possibly Brisbane or Melbourne, 
uh, which are the two logical diversion points. And so having the extra capacity at a Western Sydney airport means that we will be able to manage in a far more effective way the flow of air traffic, uh, the volume coming in, not only overall but in any given time frame, which means that we will be able to see a uh, great reduction in the number of aircraft that have to divert to other ports. And that can only be good in terms of marketing Australia as a reliable destination for both business and tour traffickers, um, tour uh, businesses, as well as people who wish to import and export goods using uh, the airports. This is an example. Uh, there was a promise by the government that coming into government there's a number of things we would do. The promises you've all heard, stopping the boats, which we've done, getting rid of the carbon tax, which we've done. This is one more area where the Prime Minister promised he would be the infrastructure Prime Minister and drive development and things that would create jobs. And so I'm pleased to see that this is one more area where the Australian people can look at the Abbott government and say they have actually been prepared to take a decision. It's not popular with everyone, but it is a decision that provides the potential to grow the Australian economy. Uh, and if there's one thing that I firmly believe that the coalition is characterised by, it is by looking at ways not to distribute wealth but to grow wealth, to make the pie bigger because a rising tide floats all boats and people benefit when there are more jobs and more opportunities. And certainly when I look at Badgerys Creek and I look at what uh, it will provide, uh, it has a significant uh, benefit there, both in terms of investment uh, and job creation. Uh, Ernst & Young, uh, did an analysis where they found that an airport at Badgerys Creek has the potential to generate some $24.6 billion in direct expenditure by 2060 and contribute $23.9 billion in gross domestic product to the national economy. Uh, it would be the largest job creator in Western Sydney and the construction for both the infrastructure package and the airport itself could create up to 8,000 jobs. And it's initiatives like this is the reason why we're seeing that the rate of jobs growth now under the coalition is higher, in fact multiples higher than at any time, Mr Acting Deputy President, under your government. Um, and so I think that's a thing the Australian community can look at. In terms of the value of the infrastructure that we're putting in, uh, there is a large infrastructure project, particularly around the roads, uh, to make sure that the access uh, is there. There's some $3.6 billion for a 10-year road investment package for Western Sydney. Uh, the Commonwealth is going to be contributing some $2.9 billion to that. Now, the actual roads that are laid out, uh, you can go and look up that detail, but what it says to me is that there is planning that has gone on here uh, to actually create an asset in terms of the airport, more importantly to integrate it with the infrastructure in Sydney. And it's that long-term planning that I'd like to turn to now. One of the things that I do give credit to the former government for is their aviation green paper and white paper and the NASAG process that came out of that, which is a safeguarding our airports process. It's the whole idea of trying to get cooperation between the federal government and state governments and local government uh, around planning permissions to safeguard airports. Um, I'm a little disappointed that it seems to have plateaued and the, the hard work of taking the policy concept and implementing it appears to have stalled, and that may not all be the federal government's fault. Um, it takes cooperation from states and local government as well to make those things happen, and we're seeing a lot of discussion with the Federation white paper and COAG processes, and I think both sides of politics suffer the frustration of our three levels of government and sometimes not be able to drive very good common sense ideas through. But can I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, NASAG and the process of protecting our airports and the airspace that go with them uh, is something that we do need in the national interest to get some alignment between the federal government, whichever political persuasion, and the state and local governments. Why? Because it's important to our economy, it's important to lots of social functions, whether that be things like banking, mail services, medical services. Uh, where we don't protect airports and the airspace, we will see a degradation in the ability of the aviation industry to service Australia in the manner to which we've become accustomed. The reason it's important that this process get in place is that I frequently come across people at both local government and state government level 
who are interested in developing their communities, and I fully understand and appreciate that, but whether it's housing close to airports or whether it's large high-rise buildings in a capital city that infringe into the airspace, the PANSOPS criteria, uh, those things have a direct impact on the viability of airlines to carry the kind of loads they look at. In South Australia, for example, there was a great deal of contention a year or so back. People looked at the height of city buildings and were complaining about what they called the archaic regulations that stopped us having even higher buildings. And there was quite some discussion in the media about that and a bit of a head of steam developing that these were really archaic rules, we should change them, we should have higher buildings. What people didn't realise was that the height limits were actually related to operations out of the airport. And so if you were taking off out of Adelaide Airport on the northeasterly runway and you were flying in a, on a cloudy day with a low cloud base or by night uh, and you had an engine failure in a large transport aircraft with passengers or cargo, then the airspace has to allow for the worst case in terms of your performance and your climb configuration for you to control the emergency and then return the aircraft to the airfield. If you build higher buildings, then the aircraft has to be able to outclimb the worst case, which is an intersection with that building, which means that the operators are then constrained to carrying less fuel, which means they can go a shorter distance, or they have to offload passengers or cargo. And so eventually you start constraining the operations to the point where airlines are not prepared to come and actually service that centre. And so the long-term planning uh, that NASAG envisaged is something that it's really important we get in place.